Hey everyone, welcome to day three as we continue our conversation, our just our little dip in our toes into the whole arena of worship. It's such a great um, area to study so much we can learn, so much we can grow. So if you missed parts one and two, today is part three. If you missed one and two, go back and listen to them. The, uh, the, first, the first part we talked about finding the heart of worship and how important that is. The second part we talked about how when we truly learn to worship it, it really flows out of love and and the just the change that that makes and how Jesus views that and then today uh we're actually going to talk today is my my favorite I, I feel we haven't taught on it enough but it's really talking about worship being our weapon of warfare and how that you know how that changes things how it just um man the battles that are fought there so that's what we're going to talk about today so I want to read the part um, part of Psalm 8, and it says, Yahweh, our sovereign God, your glory streams from heaven above, filling the earth with the majesty of your name. People everywhere will see your splendor. You have built a stronghold by the songs of children. Strength rises up with the chorus of infants. This kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. See, here's the thing, childlike worship will silence the madness of those around us, okay? There's something, we're told to have that childlike faith, and you think about when a child begins to sing, like they don't care who's around, they don't care how they sound, they'll twirl, they'll dance, they'll clap, they'll shout, because there's an utter abandon. It's, it's like they haven't realized yet that they need to be self-conscious about this. And so I look at this and it's like, you know, you have built a stronghold by the songs of children. What does that mean for us to become um, like children in our worship? It builds a stronghold. It builds that wall. It builds the protection. It builds a safe haven. Strength rises up with a chorus of infants. Infants are not strong per se. I mean, um, you know, they're, they're not going to be out there lifting weights and, you know, moving mountains and yet strength rises with the chorus of infants i was outside the other day and you know scripture also tells us in the psalms that let everything that has breath praise the lord and if you just silence yourself when you're outside and just listen you're going to hear praise going up worship going up because everything that has breath praise the lord there's so much worship there's so much praise more going on than what we realize you know, back to uh, Psalm 8, verse 2 in the Amplified, it says, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established strength. There, there's so much here that when we put our inhibitions aside and when we put our insecurities aside, when we put our religious traditions aside, when we put our fears aside, when we put our people pleasing aside, when we put our insecurities aside and we really begin to worship, everything changes. Now, think about this. Some, some believe there, there is a theological split here, so I want to state this, but some believe that Satan's role in heaven was as a musician. And again, there's some debate about that, but this is what I want to say. You know, um, we know that music, that worship is what part of what takes place around the throne room of God, right? So, you know, in Revelation 5 8 and 15 2 they mentioned harps being used in the worship of god so we also know it's going to include singing and no matter what whether or not satan was like the chief musician or not what we do know is in his time in heaven before the fall he experienced radical worship he experienced a true worship that uh that happens in heaven okay so when we talk about worship as a weapon We have to understand that in the demonic realm, they lie. I mean, he's the father of lies, right? That's who they are. Pure worship always involves truth. Go back to day one as we were talking. The day is coming. Jesus is telling the, the woman at the well, the day is coming when, when my people will worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, in spirit, the fullness of who we are, our hearts engaged and in truth. And truth always defeats the enemy. Truth always drives away the schemes of Satan. Truth always in, uh, ushers in light from the kingdom of heaven. So pure worship always ushers in, always brings in, always speaks, always proclaims truth. 
You see, a believer who understands the power of worship can praise and worship their way out of deception, out of discouragement, out of hopelessness, out of doubt, out of um, confusion. Why? Because those things aren't part of heaven. Okay, they're things that we deal with here on earth. They're things that, that get fed from the pit of hell, but they're not, they're not our DNA. They're not our inheritance. It's not our destiny. So when we learn to worship in spirit and truth, when we learn to pour out love as we worship, then it actually becomes a weapon against the demonic realm, against the kingdom of darkness, even against the battles that go on in our head that, that just come from our belief system in the areas where we've had pain, we've had wounding, and our beliefs may not line up with what God says. It also battles them. So because what it does is it, it brings our focus into the heavenly realm. You see, worship ushers in the very heartbeat or the principles of heaven. Praise brings strength. We already looked at Psalm 8-2, where, you know, out of, you know, where it's out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established strength, okay? Out of the um, strength rises up from a chorus of infants is how the passion says it. So it's that that strength coming in as we begin to worship is because right there, remember, Psalm 8 starts with Yahweh, our sovereign God, your glory streams from the heavens above, filling the earth with the majesty of your name. Okay, so we enter in, people everywhere will see your splendor. Strength rises up. Okay, you build a stronghold by the, by the uh, songs of the children. Are, are the children of God singing? Are we building that stronghold? I would suggest we have some work to do. So again, praise brings about strength. Psalm 8.2 and then also Matthew 21.16. In Matthew 21.16 in the Amplified, it says, and they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus replied to them, yes. Have you never read in the scripture out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared and provided praise for yourself. Be interesting question. I think back to some of the times when my kids were crying. You know, I, I didn't know that I should ask the question, okay, do they need something or is this praise? Like what's going on? You know, I tend to think when they're kind of cooing, you know, that gentle, sweet sound, maybe they're praising. You know, it, there's so much happening in this world that we don't even understand. But if if we go to you know, there's the songs of children that build a stronghold and, and the chorus of infants brings in strength. There's so much more happening than what we understand. So how do we go back into that childlike faith, even in a space of warfare and understand that worship is a weapon? You see, silence, uh, praise silences the enemy. First Corinthians 14, 33 out of the Amplified, it says, for he, who is the source of their prophesying is not a God of confusion and disorder, but peace and order. So when we, again, when we begin to truly worship and praise our King, it ushers in order because confusion is not from the Lord. Okay. Disorder is not from the Lord. There's this peace that comes in because we begin to worship because our focus is shifted and it opens heaven up and it brings heaven to earth. Also, Praise opens the door for deliverance. And I want to camp here just for a moment. We're going to go into Second Chronicles, one of my favorite stories. And we're going to talk about King Jehoshaphat. Okay, and this is one that just let your imagination run with this a little bit. But I, I'm just going to jump through uh, chapter 20 a little bit, just to give us that bird's eye view as to what's going on in this moment, because this intrigues me no end. Okay, so Jehoshaphat, he's the king. And what happens is that a number of armies joined together because they wanted to defeat him in battle, okay? So here come the hordes of the armies and he, and he hears and that this, this large multitude is coming against you from across the Dead Sea, okay? And what happens in that moment? Well, the same thing that happens to any of us when we're be about to be attacked by a horde, okay? Fear, fear, right? Isn't that where we go? Fear, anxiety, insecurity. The, oh no, what if, what if this happens? Like our heads can go right down that rabbit, right down that rabbit trail. It's like, we'll begin to figure out the worst of the worst and the worst possible scenario that's going to happen. And then we're also trying to figure out how we're going to fight it in our own strengths and all this. And we're going, we're going 10 million different ways. Okay. But it's being driven. It's being fed by fear. And so 
And what does the king do? He calls for a fast. Brings in the spiritual disciplines, okay? He calls for a fast. Because he's, he's, seating, he's setting himself up to seek the Lord. And he wants the people to seek the Lord because this doesn't just affect him as king. It affects the nations. We have to understand that how we respond to God doesn't just impact us. It impacts our nations. Very, very important. Okay. And so he calls the people to fast too. And then they, they gather together and, and he prays. And, and if you look at verse um, six, you see that prayer, oh, God of our fathers, are you not God of the heavens? You know, do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nation in your hands, strength and might? No one can oppose you. He goes and he begins to recount the goodness of God, who God is, the attributes of God. And then he goes through some of the history as to what God has done. In other words, reminding part of part of getting to that place of worship and warfare is also reminding ourselves who God is. So then if we go down to um, verses 14 and following there, the, the spirit of the Lord falls on one of the men and he gives a prophetic word. And he says, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear, do not be dismayed because of this great army for the battle is not yours, but God's tomorrow go up, gives them the battle plan, takes your possessions, your position, stand and observe, do not fear, do not be filled with terror tomorrow, go out before them for the Lord will be with you. So what's interesting in this, if, and I just skipped through it, but it is a word from the Lord. Okay. So the Lord said, I'm here. I've got this. You're going to win. But in no place here does it say to go and worshiping. It just says you're going to win. You're going to you're going to go in. It will not be necessary for you to fight. Just take your position, stand and observe the deliverance the Lord has for you. Can you imagine? You want me to go into battle, you want me to go into war, and you want me to stand and trust that you're going to deliver me. Easier said than done. Okay, if you were really honest, it's easier said than done. Um, but Josephat's response to that is he bows his face to the ground, as do all the people. And they fall before the Lord to worship. That's their response. They fall before the Lord to worship. So eventually they all go to bed. They get up early. Jehoshaphat comes and says, you know, he says, listen to me, Judah. And all those dwelling in Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, you will be supported, believe as prophet, you will succeed. And this is very interesting, verse 21. And then, just say then, he consulted with the people, just say consulted, and appointed singers for the Lord and those praising him in holy attire as they went before those equipped for battle, saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. What intrigues me about this is when the prophetic word came that gave the battle plan, it did not say sing the, send the singers out first. It did not say go into battle worshiping. What it said is don't be dismayed, don't fear, don't be dismayed. The battle's not yours, but God's. Go down against them. Told them where to have the, have the battle at. That's important too. When we're battling, Lord, where is this to take place? What's the place? What's the time? So he gave them the place. Okay, he gave them the time, which was tomorrow. And he said to take your positions and stand. Nothing about worship in there. And yet the king consults with the people. And in the midst of this, there's this idea that they come up with to appoint the singers for the Lord and those praising him in holy attire as they went before those equipped for battle. So they were still equipped for battles. Okay, they still had their swords at their side. Their warriors were there ready to fight. It's not that they, they went in their everyday attire into battle. They, they were dressed for battle, but they began by worshiping. And, you know, as those warriors stepped foot into battle, what were they walking in? They were hearing the worship. Okay, I'm sure they were even joining with the worshipers. They were making a racket for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what were they saying? Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Over and over and over as they marched into war, as they marched into battle, as they marched into a conflict where they were outnumbered and should not have been able to win. And yet praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Look at verse 20, uh, 22. It begins with the word when when just say when 
when they began singing and praising, when they began singing and praising, when they began singing and praising, is it possible that some of our wars we have lost because we did not begin with singing and praising? We lost our focus. Okay. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set the ambushes and the enemy was defeated. And so basically when Judah gets there, when King Jehoshaphat gets there, <laughs> they find it had already been handled and they just needed to go and gather up the, the plunder. And it's interesting because there was so much plunder, so many things for them to gather from these armies that it took three days. You know, usually you don't carry a lot into battle, but there was so much there that it took them three days to gather all of it. And um, of course, when they return, they return with great joy. They've been vi victorious, but they were victorious through a word of the Lord and worship. The result of all that, the result of that type of worship, verse 29, and it happened that the terror of God was on all the kingdoms of the lands who heard the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was quiet because God gave him a rest on all sides. You see, praise causes confusion in the demonic ranks. It's again like that high-pitched squeal of a sound system that causes you to flee. Like you can't, the, the pitch is so high that it just hurts. And that's what praise and worship that come from the heart that flow with love in the presence of God due to the enemy. The demonic cannot stand, cannot stand when the believer worships in spirit and in truth, trusting God. And uh, so this is one of the things I don't think that the church has understood is that prayer is a component of warfare. Notice they pray. Worship is also a component of warfare. And sometimes I think we pray, but we don't, we don't do the worship component. Or we're told to go in and fight this battle using worship. And it can feel counterintuitive to how we've been trained and what we've been taught. But you see, here's the thing. Praise, worship always invites us into the presence of God. Always, always invites us into the presence of God. Psalm 149, I just want to, you know, begin to wrap up with this. Psalm 149 says, hallelujah, praise the Lord. It's time to sing to God a brand new song so that all his holy people will hear how wonderful he is. May Israel be in enthused with joy because of him. And may the sons of Zion pour out their joyful praises to their king. Break forth with dancing, make music and sing God's praises with the rhythm of drums. For he enjoys his faithful lovers. He adorns the humble with his beauty. He loves to give them victory. His godly lovers triumph in the glory of God. And their joyful praises will rise up even while others sleep. God's high and holy praises fill their mouths. For their shouted praises are weapons of war. These warring weapons will bring vengeance on the nations and every resistant power. Divine kings with chains and rulers with iron shackles, praise-filled warriors will enforce the judgment decreed against their enemies. This is the honor he gives to all his godly lovers. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So something has to shift and something has to, has to change as we learn to worship and as we learn to praise. It is a season, and the season is now. It is here where we are to learn to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And we have to step into that. So a couple of things. One is I, I was actually, um, I'm looking for the book so I can make sure I get it right. There is a book. Um, the author is Zach Meese, and it is called How to Worship a King. And you can find it on the resource page on my website. Of course, I, it's available You know where you can get books. But if you want to grow in your worship, if you really want to lean down into this, that is a phenomenal book. So if you want to go deeper, I would encourage you to grab that. We'll, we'll put it in the notes. We'll put the link down there. 
um, so that you can get it because it is powerful and you are created to worship. I'm created to worship. And when we understand the wholeness of this, it, it's, it's not just, it's, it's ascribing to God the worth he's due. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's tuning our hearts to him. Absolutely. It is also a weapon of warfare. And we, we need to come to a place where we understand that, where we really go into worship. So your homework, go to Psalm 149, read through that. What does that mean? What does it, what, ask the Lord to show you more about that. And also go into uh, Second Chronicles 20 with the story of King Jehoshaphat and ask the Lord to just reveal, you know, the, the word of God is living and the Lord loves to pull back the layers so that we can understand, so that we can understand what would have been our response if we were in King Jehoshaphat's position. How would we have walked this? How would we have responded as the people? You know, Lord, teach us, show us our hearts because we need to understand. I, I firmly believe we've lost a lot of battles because we have not understood the timing of the Lord in some cases. In some cases, we haven't understood um, the positioning where we're to position for the battle. And sometimes we have not understood the strategy because it hasn't made sense to us. There is nowhere in the natural realm where, where bringing worship into a battle would make sense. And yet in God's kingdom, it can be the weapon that's used to defeat the enemy. So there you have it. This is day three. Make sure if you haven't done it, you go back and listen to segments one and two. You are here for such a time as this. You are created You are for worship. You are created for victory. You are created to walk in the fullness of who God's called you to be. So don't ever stop short. And if you're battling right now, if you're struggling with depression, with hopelessness, with fear, with anxiety, I'm going to encourage you just step into worship. Now is the time. Now is the time to step into worship because you are made for worship. You are created for more. You are created for victory. Have a great day and be so blessed.